Good day, and welcome to the exclusive sneak peek of Cinema Libre's documentary, The Great Postal Heist. Please welcome Irene Gao, the Executive Director of Courage California, who will be hosting our event today. Irene? And good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining Courage California and Cinema Libre Studio for an exclusive sneak peek of their new documentary, The Great Postal Heist. At Courage, we speak truth to power, create informative engagement tools, and provide a progressive digital community to help Californians effectively and courageously engage in politics in their communities. Since 2020, Courage has campaigned to save the U.S. Postal Service, and we recently joined a national coalition of groups to scale this work. Tonight is a special opportunity for us to engage more deeply on why and how we can support the long-term health and sustainability of the Postal Service. Over 1,500 of you registered to join us tonight, so I'm glad to see this level of energy and engagement. I'm thrilled to have you all with us right now. The Great Postal Heist exposes the decades-long effort to dismantle the U.S. Postal Service, a campaign that started long before the current Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy. We wanted to share this compelling film with you, our members, because we know that you will do what it takes to save this essential institution. The U.S. Postal Service allows us to vote from the safety of our homes, delivers food and medicines, and most recently has sent free COVID test kits to over 60 million U.S. households. The post office is essential to our well-being and civic life. And what's evident in the great postal heist is that there's been a coordinated long-term effort to dismantle and privatize the postal service for corporate profit and at the expense of its workers and the services we all depend on. So in a moment, we'll have the exclusive opportunity to dive deeper into this by viewing and discussing key clips of the film directed by Jay Gellion, the son of a postal clerk. In the film, Jay investigates the dark history of the U.S. Postal Service and also documents the brave workers standing up to injustice on the job and fighting to save the people's post office. And on a personal note, uh, this film also feels very personal for me because I have an aunt and an uncle who are retired lifelong postal workers in New Jersey. Um, I'm excited for tonight because we're joined by Jay, our director. Hi, everybody. Hi, Irene. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great Our to be here. Organizer and, um, and podcaster. Yeah. And we're also going to be joined tonight by Ron. Hi, Ron. It's good to see you. Hi, Irene. Uh, thanks for uh, Courage California for having me. With Courage, we can. Thank you. So before we get into tonight's event, I'd like to do a brief land acknowledgement. Courage California acknowledges our presence on the traditional and unceded territory of thousands of First Nations who are the traditional caretakers of this land we call the United States. As visitors on this land, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, relatives, and future generations. All right, so now for a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, over the next hour and a half, we'll be watching several closed caption clips from the film. And then in between those clips, our panel will discuss um, the clips and take your questions. So. As you have questions, please share them in the chat beside the screen if you're joining us on the Courage California website. If you're joining us on social media, please leave your question as a comment. And members of our team who are monitoring are, be, are gonna pass the questions along to myself and the panel. Um, and last thing I wanna know, I'd also like to thank Hidra Hamid and Neil Cordova from ASL Pro Bono for providing interpretation for tonight's event. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started. Uh, we'll start with the opening of the film, which sort of establishes what the Postal Service means to our communities. The young handicapped guy right here. What's up, Jason? And he usually comes out, gets his mail. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? <laughs> no! 
All right, is that good? All right, you got it, Jason. Have a good day, bud. Be careful. You know, he can't get in the box or anything, so I'll usually, I'll hold his mail for him and they'll come out and I'll give him his mail. I mean, you just befriend these people. They're like family today. So I see them coming up, I'll just grab their mail or something like that. They get things like clockwork, like their medicine, their checks, you know? So you know when that's coming, and they know. Some customers get that special attention. Seatbelt on. It's part of the job. When it gets to that point, too, it's not even like a job, you know? It's just like a normal family thing that you're doing with them, you know, for them. You can leave a letter on your door and it will be hand delivered to a spot thousands of miles away in the most remote corner of the United States. It's just really great. I mean, I don't think there's a bigger bargain in the world these days. That's a miracle right there. It takes three or four of those to get my normal cup of coffee. But you can get this letter anywhere in the world and any trust that's gonna go there. The Postal Service delivers 155 billion pieces of mail every year, approximately 40% of the world's mail. You can actually see the people that you're touching, and I'm a people person, so it gives me a good feeling. Good. 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 We come here for the news, we come here for our mail, for the kids to play. I mean, this is just kind of our social point of um, Evanston. It's a post office, and you know the postmaster. If there are clerks there, you know them. You know they're there to serve you. They see each other. They get to talk about things that are happening and what they need to get involved in in town. It can be politics. It can be a bond issue. It can be that there's a forest fire two miles down the road coming your way. Each place is composed of different people, and every, everybody's got a story to tell. The post office is kind of a window on the world. You look forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. It's a nice interlude. Hi, Jack. How are things? And a little bit of information about the neighborhood and the community. Take this picture. <laughs> a real life spice in the community. The first thing I learned when I came to the Postal Service was three words, the sanctity of the mail. I'm Jay, and this is my dad. Right now we're in front of the Maplecrest Station in Maplewood, New Jersey. My job was box clerk, window clerk. And I spent many wonderful years here taking care of beautiful customers. He always had a lot to say about his job at the post office. I felt a feeling of accomplishment every day I came home from work. I love the attitude of those that work here. They're very personal. They give you good advice like we just got it today. I like to help people. I care about them and I want to give them the best service and most knowledgeable service that I could. After hearing the stories for 27 years and watching what he went through to keep his job, I set out to uncover if what happened to him was happening everywhere. So, of course, the mail is very personal to all of us. I know, I remember growing up, I still have this feeling of this excitement of getting mail. And I know that's something my kids share as well. Jay, throughout the film, you frame the Postal Service yeah. with a really strong sense of family and community. Um, you introduced him a little bit in the opening of this film. Tell us a little bit about your father and what you felt growing up about the Postal Service through his experience. Well, it just felt like it was um, really that part of the community that beyond um, what the business transactions that they were, you know, I, my dad 
would take me to work with him. If it was, uh, you know, a day that I had off of school or a day that I, you know, a half day of school, I'd go there. You know, I'd spend time at the post office. Um, he would let me, you know, I, I'd mention it in the movie, but he would let me um, sell, count change for customers and sell stamps. And there was just this personal interaction that I could tell that he had with everyone there. Um, you yeah, know, it was his personality. He, he had that with a lot of people in the community, but he brought it um, to his job in a really unique way. And it highlighted and emphasized just the idea that it's so much more than a business. It's this presence in the community. And yeah, like you said, my kids too, every day, they're like fighting over who gets to go check the mail because, you know, it's especially in these last two years when, you know, we've been more isolated. It's been really exciting to be able to connect with one another, um, with family and friends through our mailboxes and just very excited to get packages and to get letters from, from people. Um, so it's something that is just completely intangible. Uh, you know, you can't put a dollar figure on it. The, you know, the people that take care of you in the communities and the mail carriers that show up on your door. And, you know, like you said, it was just a, a big part of my life, obviously, because my dad was, and that's good to hear too, that you have um, family that were also postal workers in New Jersey. That's funny. Yeah, and I, I think especially under the pandemic, right? I mean, there are some people for whom like their postal deliver was probably the person they saw most consistently in their lives. They're just very much a part of the fabric of our communities. So Ron, my question to you is, how long did you work for the Postal Service? What originally motivated you to join the Postal Service? And what was sort of your initial experience when you started working there? Well, I've been working, I worked for the Postal Service for 18 years. And uh, after I retired from the US Navy with 20 years, I, I was looking for something else to do to start a new career. And there were some military opportunities for me but I also applied for the Postal Service. So the Postal Service was actually the first person to call me. So I said, uh, that'd be interesting. I'd like to try something different. So the next thing you know, I got hired and I, I got assigned to working in the processing and distribution center. And I was really amazed at what goes on inside of a processing and distribution center. I never knew anything about mail until I got to that processing center. I always thought that would, once you give your letter to a letter carrier or the clerk at the counter, that was it. But there's so much more to the postal service behind the scenes. So it was a lot of fun and I learned a lot. And I really, uh, and like Jay shows in his film, USPS is the trusted and visible form of the federal government in every community. Uh, I think most postal workers love their jobs and the customers love us too. So. And I, I really had a good time. No place is perfect, but uh, I enjoyed the work that I did at the Postal Service because it's very important. And being a veteran, we love mail and we want to get our mail on time, all the time, anywhere we are, especially in a hostile, you know, fire zone or something. Hey, thank you, Ron. And Jay, I'm really curious, how long did you did your father work in the Postal Service? He worked there for 30 years. Yeah. Um, so he's wow. now retired for, yeah, he's <laughs> he's he's always got an incredible memory for dates. Um, so, you know, I don't, I think it's been at least, uh, at least 10 years since he's been retired and uh, enjoying that. But yeah, he worked there, you know, my whole, as, as far back as I can remember. Um, and yeah, it was just a, it's a secure job. It's a really good job. There's so many talented people that are working at the, at the postal service. Um, and you know, the way that the economy and the, 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 you know, the job economy has been since the eighties, it's been very tenuous. And so you have people like my dad who have a college degree, who stick it out at the postal service because it's um, it, it provides a really secure um, life for your family. I mean, he was able to you know put me through college, and you know we had a roof over our head. We didn't have to worry. 
Um, and, you know, it was because of this unique job in the landscape that, you know, exists in all these, all these different places. So, you know, he, uh, you know, he fought hard to stay there, even, even with the, um, the strife that, you know, the film will go into, um, that the film discusses, um, it's, it's, it's a job worth fighting for, for a lot of people. Thanks, Jay. And, and Ron, sort of repeating this theme of the Postal Service itself, it seems like colleagues have sort of the familial community feel, but also, I mean, you guys have such extensive relations with people you're just seeing every day in so many neighborhoods. I mean, that's just, right, there's very few jobs or roles where people have that privilege and very few people who are that well connected to so many different people in our communities. Yes, uh, we, we love what we do. And, and Jay's film is gonna show you how much we love what we do. And I always go back to the mantra, you know, if you're on the outside looking in, you don't understand it. And if you're on the inside looking out, you can't explain it. So uh, Jay's film does an outstanding job of that. And I wanna say going back in history, the founding fathers envisioned the impact of mail and they wrote it into the constitution. So Article 1, Section 8. Thank you, Ron. So this is a great segue. So the film moves from this opening sequence about postal service and postal workers as part of, again, the fabric of our communities, to then detailing how over decades, corporations and political leaders, um, Republicans and Democrats, conspire to privatize the postal service for profit and personal gain. So the next clip we're gonna watch covers the first strike by postal workers during the Nixon administration in 1970 to fight back against leadership that was failing its workers. This is also the beginning of efforts to privatize the postal service. And we called it a wildcat strike because postal workers went out on strike in opposition to what the union leaders were advising them to do. In several large cities, the post offices are shut down. In New York, for example, the mail system is wholly paralyzed by illegal walkout. The government immediately obtained a court order against the strike, and union leaders ordered the carriers back to work. Many refused. I don't like to go on strike, but we must, because they've been pussyfooting too long. You can't live in New York City on what they're giving you. Prior to the strike, raises were dictated by Congress. Congress said, yeah, we're going to give them a raise. Congress says, no, we're not going to give them a raise. That's what created the strike. I've been told I'm eligible for welfare, but I don't want to take welfare. We want to work, but this is the only means we have of letting Congress know that we cannot take it any longer. Either they give us what we should have, or we will stay out on strike until hell freezes over. I pulled the Berkeley Heights office out, eight to 10 clerks in there. I was a young buck, and I took a chance. Uh, in reality, where everybody that walked the line, I should have been fired. But we took a chance to make it better for everybody else. Well, what if what you're doing is illegal? I don't care. If they want to put me in jail, put me in jail. But they haven't got a jail big enough to put all of us in. The strike has spread from coast to coast. Now it directly affects 14 states and has involved about 200,000 postal workers. I have just now directed the activation of the men of the various military organizations to begin in New York City the restoration of essential mail services. Do you think uh, you're doing it as fast as a postal worker? No, I don't. No. He, he must have his own little tricks because I can't find half the spots. What exactly are you doing? I don't really know. <laughs> Finally, Nixon had to give the postal workers what they were asking for. This decision that I have made. 12% pay increase, quicker raises, no penalties for local union leaders. Collective bargaining and binding arbitration. And I am grateful for the strikers. Because if it wasn't for the strikers of 1970, we wouldn't be where we are today in the Postal Service. 
and everybody you know knows today what happened. We've got the American Postal Workers Union. We got the Postal Service and a private corporation, semi, uh, and we made out. It put them on a different footing with management, being able to strike this major operation and essentially bring it to its knees. I would say that it wasn't a wholesale victory. The forces around Nixon said, make the post office stand on its own two feet and only operate within its own revenues. And so they pulled it out of the post office department, which was a cabinet level department, and put it into a public corporation. They called themselves the Citizens Committee on Postal Reform. They were Standard Oil, Bank of America, Boeing, Coca-Cola, and a host of giant corporations. Their goal was to take the post office out of the hands of Congress and the president, to have it run by a board of governors made up of corporate insiders. In 1970, with workers satisfied by higher pay, they got their wish, and the Postal Reorganization Act became law. The first chairman of the new U.S. Postal Service was Fred Capel, former AT&T CEO. Though the new law begins with the founder's vision for a postal service operated as a basic and fundamental service to bind the nation together, Capel's vision of a corporation with leaders not accountable to the people has proven stronger. Hello and thanks for joining me today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about the situation that we find ourselves in today in regards to the Postal Service and our entire business. The bottom line is this, we have got to constantly look at what we can do to cut expenses in an attempt to track revenue uh, going forward. And people will say, well, this is a service business. We shouldn't have to worry about that. We are a business. You work in a business. You know, we are no different and any other business out there. As always, thank you for the great job that you do every day, and I'll talk to you next time. The nature of privatization in the U.S. Postal Service is very much hidden from public view. It's privatization from the inside out. So you still see the U.S. Postal Service letter carrier delivering the mail to your door. But all the people involved from getting it from, say, the business in Chicago to your local postal center may not have been postal employees because that whole segment of the U.S. mail stream may have been privatized. What the U.S. Postal Service provides FedEx and UPS is what they call the last mile, uh, which is expensive if they have to go the last mile to the destination to deliver we have Federal Express who drops off parcels. You purchase the item on the internet. You think that you're going through Federal Express because that's the only option you're given on the internet. Federal Express then takes them and drops them off at the post office and we deliver them. So from this point, the film explains how the U U.S. Postal Service was privatized more from the inside out. There became a fundamental disconnect between leadership pushing for profit and postal workers fighting for serving our communities. This push for profit led to new leadership surveilling and bullying postal workers to cut corners, leading to low morale in the workforce, which then resulted in shootings in postal workplaces throughout the 1980s and 1990s. Postal workers were clearly pushed beyond the limits and the original purpose of the postal service is corrupted by corporate leadership. Um, so before I ask um, Jay and Ron a couple of questions, I do want to remind folks again that we welcome questions at any time. If you're joining us from the Courage California website, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, and if you're joining us on social media, you can leave your questions in the comment and those will make their way to us as well. Uh, so with that, Ron, I'm curious, what was your personal experience of how these kinds of changes affected you and your colleagues? Well, first, let me uh, start with, you know, I, as I look at that wildcat strike, I, I also read, I have the mag, the 1969 uh, Life magazine, and inside of it, there was a report, and it was entitled uh, The Mail Mess. And back then, PMG Lawrence O'Brien, he told Congress, your post office is in a race with a catastrophe. The guy who took over after him, PMG Winton Blount, 
he said he inherited unbelievable conditions of political influence and operational ineffectiveness. But back then, just like now, the plans to turn the post office into a private business faced huge obstacles from Congress and the unions. So in, in the salary back then, the postal salary was $8,500 a year. And at the top of the seniority chart, after five years, you would make $11,700. So the postal workers said, hey, I'm living in New York City and the cost of living is extremely high. And they were getting the same amount of money as a postal worker, say, in Montana. So they were really disgusted with all the conditions and it led to that. But after the strike and the reorganization, you know, the unions got stronger and, and things got better for us. You know, more, we had more bargaining power. So it made the Postal Service what it is today and it's, it's way better. And I'm so glad that they did that. And I'm so glad that we have strong unions in the United States Postal Service. So Ron, following up on that, I mean, you must have seen as corporate leader leaders came in and were just really starting to tighten things, you must have also experienced and felt some of that too while you were working there over the 18 years. What was it sort of like and what was morale sort of like in the workplace as these sort of changes were coming very top down? Well, the, the morale takes a big hit because what happens is the leaders who come into the postal service, and many of them have grown up in the postal service to become leaders, but it seems like the higher they get, the more they forget about, you know, the workers and what they did and what we're going through. So the workplace becomes nothing but worrying about numbers. We gotta get these numbers. And the numbers creates a lot of stress on management as well as craft people. And there's something that's gotta change but it's still there today. We're still driving numbers and we're forgetting out about people. People are the ones who bring in the numbers. So that's something that's got to change in the culture. And I hope that somebody like Mr. DeJoy can watch this film and he can hear these comments and start trying to change the company from the upper levels and, and show some respect for the workforce out there. Thank you, Ron. And Jay, for you, I know this was also very personal for you as well, um, because in in a part of the film, your father shares his own personal experience talking about how he was afraid to go into work because of the shootings and sort of the, what morale, but also the atm atmosphere was kind of like in the workplace. What do you remember about this shift in how your dad felt about uh, working for the Postal Service? Jay, you might still be on mute. Thanks, Irene. Um, I just want to piggyback on what Ron said, uh, just to, as it relates to the last clip and the um, kind of shift in mindset to now this is going to be a, um, a corporation that runs on its own revenue and the, and the numbers and all the focus on the numbers. And, um, you know, what happens is you could kind of measure something to death and um, create a, a structure where at the highest levels, whether it's DeJoy or, you know, Fred Capel, who was in the Board of Governors, um, the, the AT&T CEO who we talked about in the last scene, or Donahoe, where they're just um, putting out an idea of what postal workers can um, can give on an idea of what these metrics are, what the numbers that they want to receive are, but they're unrealistic because of how far removed these governors are from the day-to-day -day operations of what people are doing at the post office. And so it's this kind of squeeze, this crunch and disconnect between we want to do more with less. We want to make sure that everybody below us is delivering these numbers so that I can make my pay for performance bonus, and it kind of trickles down into basically a powder keg at the at the workroom floor. And, you know, that's, I think, you know, where, where you're going with that is, you know, what my dad saw and what a lot of the postal workers I spoke to saw was a place that seemed 
that had such high stress levels that, you know, people were afraid that somebody was going to just kind of lose it. And that's what we saw happen in the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, my my dad definitely, um, I didn't see it so palpably from him. He went into work and he was, uh, you know, kind of always seemed to me unafraid. He was kind of, you know, just bravely went to work and, and did his job because he enjoyed the camaraderie that he had with his coworkers and with the people that he took care of. Um, but, but I, you know, that's, that's what, what was on the nightly news. That's what was on the nightly news when, when I was a kid was um, these incidents that, that blew up. There were, you know, there were dozens of them that happened um, throughout the eighties and nineties. And sh sure, you know, it, it definitely leaked into our home, that kind of fear. Um, and especially when it hit, um, as we talk about a little bit in the movie, um, an office really close to home, you know, you could go visit a place where one of these incidents happen and it really just kind of, um, puts it into a, you know, a stark reality. Thanks, Jay. So we, we do have a question about how to reverse the sort of privatization process, which we will get to a little bit later. I do want to, though, underscore a big theme for for both the film and for us um, as Courage California. Um, like Ron said, just respect the worker, and that's always the best starting place to go. Um, so moving on. So this next part of the film is really details how corporations claimed lucrative contracts to do the more cost-effective duties, leaving the Postal Service still needing to manage the more labor and resource intensive work to still deliver to every household in the U.S. But here's an inter interesting fact that you highlight in the film. By 2006, the Postal Service was making $1 billion a year and supporting a $1 trillion mail industry. But yet the public is led to believe that the Postal Service is failing. And as Ron mentioned before, this was uh, this kind of messaging was sort of trickling back in the late 60s and 70s. So next, we're going to watch a clip that highlights how the U.S. Postal Service budget was exploited in an attempt to balance the federal budget under George W. Bush's administration and how it led to sort of the reduction of services we're still fighting against today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a third quarter, and you're down by 25 points. And if Tom Brady doesn't come in, the fact is you're bankrupt. You're beyond bankrupt. Deferred maintenance is about $9 billion. Those vehicles and things, that just have to be restored sooner. The wheels literally will fall off. That tells us, as a businessman, that no matter what they say, they have more than a small cash flow problem. 80% of their costs are human beings. And if you've got too many human beings, you'll build in inefficiency, you'll use labor uh, poorly. Done in by decades of lavish spending, defeated by new technology. Booming last century, it's bleeding money today. It begs for a government bailout. That was a way to make the books of the post office look like they were losing money so you could portray the postal system as inefficiently unprofitable and therefore make the comparison to FedEx and UPS. Gee, they are profitable, but that's only because you didn't make them do what you made the post office do. It's hustling the public. It's shameful. In spite of the economy tanking, if we hadn't had that payment, the Postal Service would have been one of the few businesses around that actually made money. We would have been hailed as uh, a, a great success. Saddled with a $56 billion demand by the federal government, combined with the biggest financial collapse since the Great Depression, the stage was set for the hustle, the half-truth that would justify the largest downsizing in U.S. history. First-class mail is declining at a rapid pace because people are mailing less. In this information age of emails, tweets, and text messages, what we affectionately call snail mail seems somewhat impractical. The post office is essentially technologically obsolete. We all have a post office in our pocket. We must create a low-cost, streamlined operational network. They called it network rationalization. It would break apart the infrastructure that kept mail fast, affordable, and reliable. 
as we consolidate plants. We'll be moving people from one place to another. In some cases, we'll be moving employees from one job to another. Sorry, your volume's down. That's excess, the whole building. Excess this, get rid of all of it. I don't care, it's not me. Move them out and tell them to be lucky they got a job. Demonstrations sprung up across the country in 2011 and 12. We don't need no bailout. We want to get the mail out. What they're we doing across no the country bail. is they're closing postal mail facilities, and one of them here in our valley is Mid Hudson. I think it's very obvious to anybody that's immediately involved the lunacy of sending local mail. 100 miles this way or 100 miles that way when you've got the facilities and the equipment and the people right here. The fact that they would take our mail, ship it off to Albany, let them work it, bring it back, and then the trucks would arrive to deliver the mail. It's just a delay of mail service. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the fact that this should be a jewel in your system, the fact that it has a $1 a year lease, the fact that it sits in Stewart Airport, the fact that it's on the crossroads of the Northeast on two major highways. I'm here tonight as a taxpayer, small business owner, and a person who spends thousands of dollars at the post office. You're going to sink the ship completely. All of those people that we deliver to and that we process their mail, they will get it overnight, first class. What the Postal Service proposes is changing that overnight service to a two to three day service. The things that we're really concerned with are the elderly, the poor, those that are dependent on their medicines. You know, they're out there and um, they're depending on that mail to be delivered by their carrier. As far as being a letter carrier, it's very personal because I deliver to the route I grew up on. As a mail carrier, I, I deal with these people every day and I don't want to see the service get cut for them. I hate to see what the Postal Service does to our customers. They almost treat, they almost treat our customers like they don't count and that's what we're fighting for. We do think they count. You have to pay your bills. You want your bills to get there on time. You don't want to count on waiting a week and a half or two weeks or whatever the heck it's going to take. That's not, that's not right. And not everybody owns a computer. Not everybody wants to do their mail over the internet. Not everybody wants to do their banking over the internet. You look at the hacking that's going on. Mm. I rely on the Postal Service to do my business. Postal Service, you're bucking a trend here. Things are, are trying to get more local. And we're talking about getting people to commute an hour and a half in their cars. For me, it's gonna be over three hours round trip and then having these trucks go uh, distances. You're also talking about all of that pollutant. Hudson Valley is the most beautiful valley that you could imagine with the river and everything, and it's at a big expense for everybody. They're being told there's no jobs within 50 miles, might be jobs within 100 miles, and then if there's no jobs within 100 miles, they're talking maybe up to 200, 300 miles. They own homes or they live in condos. They got kids in school or kids in college. They can't afford just to pack their bag and move out. Now, Jay, earlier in the clip, you really underscore how leaders aided by corporate run mainstream media were willing to spread disinformation to really popularize a set of harmful narratives about the Postal Service. How do you see these narratives persisting in public understanding of the Postal Service now and the government in general? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, this decades old trope and it's an ideology that's, you know, been pushed by, you know, authors like Ayn Rand and, you know, presidents like Ronald Reagan that, you know, we need small government because the government is the problem and the government doesn't do anything. Um, and just look at the post office. And so they'll, you know, basically use the postal service um, as a scapegoat. And that was kind of what happened um, with this law was they, was they, they snuck in this, um, this, essentially bankrupting clause in this 
2006 law that required an unbelievable extraction of wealth from the Postal Service that no business or corporation could have withstood. And that's the complicated story to try and tell people. Not really. You know, you just have to, you know, you just have to do your job as as journalists and 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 show what happened. But the easy thing to do, especially if you're trying to push in ideology, is to say, look at the postal service, they're bleeding money. And it can make it all the way up to the speaking points of a of a democratic president. Um, because they're not, you know, that deep into the, you know, and you would expect more, but they're not that deep into the story. And so the story becomes the Postal Service is losing all this money when really um, what happened was, as um, one of the postmasters um, in, the, in the film said, they're, they're a cash cow. They're, you know, this part of the government that is actually making money. There's no other business that the government essentially owns or has control over. And they were able to game that system. And then, you know, those like Daryl Issa and you know, Fox News and others were able to create this whole narrative around it um, that, you know, was basically that the Postal Service is inefficient. Let's privatize it. Look how great FedEx is doing. Look how great UPS is doing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's still going on to this day because you have to have a nuanced conversation in order for people to understand where the money went. Um, it's easy to say the government is inefficient. <clears throat> there are government managers that should be more like, you know, Jeff Bezos or some other, you know, evil corporate overlord, and then they'd be doing a lot better. But, you know, it's nonsense. Well, so Ron, this clip also shows another moment in which postal workers, you know, with the support of local elected leaders and other community members, were able to really organize and try to stand up against, again, this failing leadership. Could you talk a little bit about when did you start organizing postal workers and what motivated you to sort of step up in this way? Well, it, I've always uh, been, you know, an activist for the job. Uh, to me, you know, listening to the stories and hearing things about privatization, you can't help but when you're in a unionized workforce, you can't help but to think, is that some form of union busting? You, you want to get rid of us so you can privatize, you know, the agency? Uh, when I think about uh, privatization before those rallies and things, I thought, of, you know, we're wondering, is that about profits before service? Is that about a mergers with companies so they can, you know, corner the market of postal services? Uh, do you want me to pay for delivery now? You know, are you going to deliver everywhere for the same price? And I was in uh, a lot of rallies, quite a few back uh, in, in during that time. And uh, we did get the elected leaders out there. And a, a big problem for somebody like Representative Issa, you know, I've never seen him at any of those rallies. And I was in his district at the time, too, down in San Diego. Uh, he never came out there to talk to us while we were fighting, you know, to save our jobs. Uh, I don't think he ever visited a plant. He never came into the plant to see what we do, to talk to rank and file or hear our concerns. The main fault that I see is it's not the inefficiency of the post office, but more about the conditions un under which the post office has to do its job. You know, by the time we get needed changes and haggle through Congress, 15 years has passed. And, and, my whole time in the Postal Service, they've been fighting that, you know, trying to get changes and get rid of that Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, you know, and all it results in is they start talking about, oh, we're going to have to get rid of people because we got fuel costs, we got labor costs, we, we got to consolidate facilities, we're going to close the post offices, we don't need so many, there's one down the road, so let's close this one, and then deploy morale takes the biggest hit. So disrupting the postal network is another thing. And then the livelihood of the employees, you know, some of the things like Jay said there, but that morale takes the biggest hit. So we, the Congress is on our side in most cases. You know, I, I saw Democrats and Republicans out there holding signs with us and, and wanting to save the postal service. 
And I think when you look at the new legislation that HR 3706, you know, there's strong bipartisan support to get rid of the PAEA and let's try to keep the postal service and keep it strong because that's what the American people want. Thank you, Ron. Um, so we have a couple questions from folks um, all around again, this question of sort of money. Jay, uh, you sort of mentioned in this film, again, like there's a point when elected leaders are really, again, trying to sell the story about the postal office, like, you know, not being in good financial shape. Like, can you just again quickly name like around what that timeline sort of was and then sort of a follow-up question to that sort of what is actually the financial standing of the post office if you sort of disregard uh th that bill and sort of that that financial burden that congress um forced the post office to sort of bear yeah well yeah that's a complicated question and i'm sure there's somebody better that can better answer that um than me but I think the 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 main takeaway is, um, well, the, the postal service was was doing great because you know mail volumes were were doing really well up until that bill um, in 2006, and there was a as I you know as we mentioned in the film as we all know there was the housing crash there was the financial collapse you know that hit the mail just like it hit all industries, and you know the shift from um, you know, to online bill pay and to email. There were all these things that, you know, chipped away at certain segments of the mail that made certain portions <clears throat> of what the USPS does um, less profitable. But what that, um, what, what basically that, um, you know, manufactured crisis enabled was for the postal managers to just be on their heels so that, now, so that from then until now, they're not in a growth mindset. They're in a cut, 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 cut mindset. And you can't, you know, engage new possible revenue streams. You can't, you know, buck the system of certain competitors who don't want to see you offer um, print, fax, um, postal banking. That's that's another big one that should really be um, done in earnest. And there's, you know, the campaign for postal banking. We could you know, talk about that and put that up as an action item um, for for some of the viewers here. But there's a lot of ways that the Postal Service could have been, um, you know, finding new ways to make revenue. And, you know, that would have been putting them on, on like a more solid financial footing. But they weren't able to do that because they were technically in debt because of this five and a half billion dollar payment. And yeah, that's made up the the lion's share of losses since 2006. You know, estimates have it at 75 to 90 percent. But when you talk about the post office isn't making money, that's why the post office isn't making money because they have that burden and they can't reinvest it. And they have to sit on you know vehicles that are catching fire. They can't you know they can't do all these um, capital investments that they should have been um, doing since then. Thank you, Jay. And Ron, um, mm -hmm. I'm really curious from your perspective, how would you phrase, like, what do we have to lose with the USPS being privatized? Well, we have to lose convenient availability of the post offices in all of our neighborhoods, uh, delivery everywhere for one price, six days a week, uh, government option in competition, and people are waiting on prescriptions, the, the ballots, supplies, packages, checks, documents. Uh, there's just so much that people want through the mail and they're used to getting through the mail. You know, everybody, like you said, is not on the internet. So, you know, change is kind of slow. And we still need to accommodate the people or else uh, many people are going to be left behind. Uh, the USPS, uh, you know, we have to grow our services where we decline in a product. So if the first class mail goes down, we got to find something to replace it with. Uh, USPS got to look to the future and we got to go from the brick and mortar to kind of click and order, you know, because <laughs> that's where we are today. You know, we're clicking order. So 
the community loses out and some people may not get mail if you privatize it or if you want me to drive this big brown truck down there i'm gonna have to charge you and we're already going there you know every day we the post office has the largest network around and that's what they're gonna lose access Thanks, Ron. And I have one more question for you, because, of course, you are both an author and a podcaster, so you've written a lot about this. Um, the question that came in from the audience is, how do we get the message out about how these private companies like FedEx and UPS are only profitable because they are using the post office to do the actual hard part, to, to take on the parts that are, again, like more labor and resource intensive? Yeah, we have to do it through the book. We have to do it through the books and the podcast and organizing. You know, we got in the postal service, they, we have four large unions and we have to really get into an organizing mode. I mean, everybody's got to stick together and get the message out. You know, the that's where the strength is at in our unity and sticking together with the message. A lot of times people think that it's only the job of the union steward or the union officers it's everybody's job in a union. Cause like they say, the injury to one is an injury to all. So let's stick together and put that message out to save our jobs. Thank you, Ron. So I'm gonna move us on to the next clip. And this is again, sort of giving a little bit more detail on how corporate leaders were using um, technology to increase their profits at the expense of workers. And also like other steps um, including, uh, you know, selling post office buildings of how, again, like this tripping away at the postal service as a, as a public, uh, public and community service. The loss of jobs is typical in, uh, in all industries as they're going to automation. The only way to be more efficient uh, is to embrace technology and automation. Today, uh, they got machines that sort so much mail that uh, you blink an eye and they got a truck full already. And what did that mean? That meant less jobs. But if you look at some of the things Amazon is talking about, drones and the like, uh, I think they're looking for a way to cut the middleman out on delivery. Drones, robots, all technological changes are now revolutionizing most of the industries in our economy. So this is a general problem. One solution is, you 50, you're fired. Go home, go on welfare, become a crook, uh, leave the country, whatever. Here's a second way. Everybody works half time. Nobody loses a job. And guess what? Nobody loses any pay either. Half the work time of everybody there, of 100 people, is now available for their families, for their own development, for their relationships, for the community. That's a benefit for the majority. We don't do that. We do the opposite. We fire 50 of them because that makes profit. Because the money you don't have to pay those 50 you fired, you, the employer, get to keep. So we allow the profit motive to shape the way technology is instituted in our businesses, public and private. Technology really needs to be used just for the betterment of our lives and not just for, you know, cutting corners, putting people out of work. I mean, I do the math and I say, well, okay, you can keep eliminating jobs because you have now a machine that can do it, but if you take it all the way to the extreme and you just have a couple people working and a whole country with just machines, who's going to buy all the stuff? How can that work? People need to be able to make a living. If delivering mail is not necessary, hey, let's not deliver mail. Let's do something necessary. Do we need houses? Do we need food? The simple story is that the decline of the U.S. Postal Service uh, coincides with the rise of the internet and email, and that story is just too simplistic. First-class mail volumes have declined, and that has created financial pressure, but if you look at mail volume as a whole, particularly if you look at the parcel segment, they have grown substantially. 
looking at internet use, people with more use of the internet or more access to the internet tend to get more mail. The role and influence of private corporations is tremendous, and their ability to shape the legal environment then really reflects their desire to limit competition. If the postal service was out of the way, don't you think FedEx and UPS uh, could charge more for what they do? If the postal service was out of the way, don't you think the uh, vampires in Congress could uh, sell off all the property and all the assets the postal service has and steal that money? All across the United States, we are losing very distinguished buildings and public art that they contain. Major buildings that the Postal Service owned, iconic, beautiful buildings in the centers of town have been sold to real estate developers for not that much money. They were designed to be among the best buildings in town, architecturally distinguished, but also the craftsmanship Artworks were commissioned for the first time for small rural towns where people had generally never seen art before, let alone public art, that depicted themselves and the work that they do and their legends and their history and their landscapes. It was to ennoble Americans who do common work so that they would know that this is part of what constitutes a civilization of all of us working together, doing our bit. The real estate portfolio, which the public owns and paid for, is variously estimated to be worth 50 to $100 billion. So anybody who can get their hands on that is going to make out very nicely, like a bandit, perhaps. The Postal Service gave an exclusive contract to the world's largest commercial real estate company, CBRE, to not only sell our property, but also to advise them on what to sell and also to lease back property which the Postal Service doesn't own to it. So this is a very nice, cushy deal. Now, where it really gets interesting is that the chair of the board and largely the owner of CBRE is none other than Richard C. Blum, a billionaire private equity capitalist who just happens to be the husband of Senator Dianne Feinstein, perhaps the most powerful senator in Congress. By any measure, this is a rather startling conflict of interest that nobody seems to have looked into and the press is scarcely mentioned. In my own city of Santa Monica, I was involved in reforms that transformed that city so that the downtown of Santa Monica became, if not the most, one of the most vibrant retail centers in all of California. And there's a beautiful post office in that set of blocks. And the Postal Service sold it to some guy who's making it into a movie studio. Whereas they could have shared that space, expanded the opportunities so that they would have ongoing revenue uh, and maintain this beautiful location in the middle of town where everybody could go to it. They've moved the post office to someplace on the other side of the freeway where the bus depot is. It's, it's really a crime. That's an area where the Postal Service has not followed my suggestions at all and I'm quite frustrated about it. In Washington, D.C., you can go to the old post office and pay the President of the United States $24 for a cheeseburger.
So, Jay, in this part of the film, you compare what is happening in the Postal Service to what you, we see happening in Amazon. And that's been getting a lot of headlines in terms of using automation to cut costs, undercut workers. Um, and there's obviously other parallels as well. You know, again, we keep seeing this in the headlines about Amazon warehouse workers and gig workers, like the constant surveillance, the intimidation, the union busting and how that really causes a high level of stress and also a lot of financial insecurity um, for the workers. Given, you know, it's it's really obvious through this clip, right, there's all these different um, of how corporate um, and elected leaders are self-interested in this and conflicted. Um, so seeing how we are, again, like seeing some of these issues mirrored in other parts of the labor workforce, what do you hope are some of the lessons from the struggles of the Postal Service that we can learn from to try to break out of this damaging cycle of over people? Um, yeah, it's it's a great question, Irene. And, you know, it, it just goes to the heart of the idea that you, you can't fully fix the postal service in a vacuum you know the postal service is part of a mail industry is part of a whole economy um that amazon is part of that all workers are a part of we need to ask these questions you know about automation i was glad that you know professor richard wolf could give voice to it in the film because he asks the obvious question, you know, and 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 poses two separate solutions, you know, if if we are really automating out of um, of of workers of having workers do the work, then then yeah, there's if 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 a machine can do the work, I I guess that makes sense, you know, that if if it can do it just as well, but then what does that mean, you know, does that mean that as as a people at large, we should all benefit from that. I mean, I think that we all need to have a, a, a voice in that because the irony is that, you know, robotics and the internet and, you know, just kind of the, the backbone of a lot of what's allowing for um, this automation away of labor was, was built through public investment, was built, um, you know, by governments and, you know, defense. Um, and yet now it's, all the benefit of it is being siphoned into a few hands of, you know, CEOs and corporate owners when really the promise of robotics and automation is that, you know, is that we should all be able to um, afford our own time for, you know, for enrichment or for focusing. I mean, there's a lot of work to do, you know, and maybe it's not um, the work that, you know, maybe it's, you know, more creative work. Maybe it's, um, you know, it's, it's a conversation that we all need to be brought into. It's a conversation that shouldn't be happening, you know, behind closed doors, you know, in corporate boardrooms. You know, if this is really what's kind of taking over industry, um, then there needs to be a democratic process about how this, um, about, about how this new technology is going to affect everyone. And so I think that's, you know, that's the main takeaway, you know, and it really needs to be a, a coalition across, you know, across, you know, labor organizations from the Postal Service to, you know, Amazon. I know they're not organized, but it's it's, you know, there's all these groups of workers that are that are rife for, you know, bringing into the fray and, and, and starting this conversation and developing a coalition. Thank you, Jay. And Ron, similar question to you. Um, obviously, as the Postal Service has been more and more privatized or corporate leaders have taken over, they've turned in some ways the Postal Service more into a product and less about a service. But obviously, the service is what people really appreciate. I mean, even with the rise of the, the internet and such, I think that personal touch um, that comes with the Postal Service is really important. So I'm curious to hear from you, like, as you're seeing again in Amazon and other places where people are trying to organize, you know, again, like what is your sort of take on, you know, what sort of comes next in terms of organizing? Because it can seem really discouraging that these corporations and their leadership are sort of getting their way, but been very 
I've been more encouraged by seeing the rise of organizing. I think like Striketober, uh, right this past October, a lot, a lot more union efforts. So I'd love to hear sort of what you see as the future of organizing as this kind of corporatization of work um, keeps expanding. Well, well, as far as uh, I think that organizing will, will never go away. Uh, the people who don't have unions, they really have to get familiar with the rules and the laws out there. If I want to start an organization, and a good place to start is the NLRB, you know, the National Labor Relations Board, and see what your rights are. And it's going to require people to, let's talk about it. We want to get a union here. We got to learn our rights and we got to do everything, you know, and then go into the workplace organized. You know, you have to almost beat the management to the, to the punch, you know, because, but the fear and the intimidation that management puts on people drives them, you know, away from trying to have a better life and a, a better workplace. So if the organizing is always gonna be there and it has to just get stronger and stronger. People will have to not be afraid and stand up and make change in this country. You know, every nobody wants to be, you know, treated like a slave, you know. Stand up for your rights and your benefits by organizing. So learn the rules and and uh, check out the NLRB so you can do it the right way. And if you happen to get booted out, the NLRB will help you. And the NLRB has an act called the National Labor Relations Act. That should be posted up in every workplace around the country. And it tells you your rights, whether you're in a union or not. So get familiar with what you can do and try something, but you can't be afraid. Yeah, and I think just to yeah. add to that, something that I learned from, you know, from Ron and from others is, you know, you need to make it fun. You need to make it part of the community. And, you know, I know Ron, when when Ron was really active, he would talk about these events that he would put on and, you know, just dinners or a Sunday that you'd have, you know, you have your coworkers, but they're also part of your community and, you know, bring your family, you know, get your family involved because this is where, you know, that camaraderie and that, you know, connection, connection happens and it's going to make people want to, um, to stand up with one another, um, essentially. Thank you both. And so the, I would say the number one question that we're getting from folks um, in the audience is how do we get rid of DeJoy and the board of governors? Jay, if you wanna try the answer, I know that's a very complicated one, but if you wanna tackle that one first. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it would take a, a ton of political pressure because it doesn't seem like even at you know the level of the White House they don't seem to have um, that goal in mind um, based on their recent um, appointees to the Board of Governors. You know, yeah, this is a governance st structure that that is is the problem um, when you have somebody at the highest level of the postal service who comes from a private contractor of the postal service and there's this revolving door of government and business then then you know this this whole organization needs to change and you know i i think the unions have been vocal about calling for this type of calling for DeJoy's ousting but you know it, it's 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 going to take the membership of these unions, the workers within those unions, to put pressure on their local chapter president, to put pressure on their regional president, to put pressure on the executive president, because you know this is business as usual, and it's easy to operate within that within that. And you know the vision that I saw when I you know when I was kind of diving into this problem, it was a coalition between community members and postal workers at a local level and, you know, have a mailing campaign, a, you know, a dump to joy mailing campaign who have access to the mail and, you know, every postal worker that's working that mail can see, you know, a flyer 
and get organized that way. Um, you know, get get wise to what 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 we're trying to do. Um, because, you know, honestly, you know, DeJoy has has put out this 10 year plan and it's another cut and slash and burn plan. And he's, you know, putting into this law, which this Postal Reform Act, basically his his mission to kind of shift the transportation network to, you know, to trucks and from planes. So it's going to be slower. So this is going to affect everybody. So I think when people are aware that it's, you know, it's it's not just affecting the workers, affecting everybody in the nation. And, you know, we need to call call our representatives. We need to call you know, get in touch with the, the local union people and, you know, keep keep that pressure going upward. You know, it's got to start from the bottom and and go upward. Irene? Thanks, Jay. Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Irene? I would, uh, I would add to that. That's exactly right what Jay said. I mean, with, with pressure, you know, pressure bus pipes, right? With pressure, we can get anything done. Uh, one of my favorite you know, labor leaders of all time was A. Philip Randolph. And, you know, he always struggled hard to get things done. He, he was able to get like African-Americans into the military. But and he went and met with presidents. And, and that, that famous line was, go out and make me do it. I agree with everything you're saying, Mr. Randolph, go out and make me do it. That's what we have to do in this country to get anything done. You know, it might be hard to get Mr. DeJoy removed. If we've all put a lot of pressure on that Board of Governors or even the President of the United States, the same way we put pressure to stop staples, we can stop harassment and bullying and everything else going on in the workplace. It works. It can't just be for the dollar. It got to be for everyday life struggles. If you don't like something, you put the pressure on it. The board of governors say, "You know what? I resign. I'm out of here." But pressure, bus pipes, and it works. So stick together, and we can get it done. You know, people stick together on social media for stuff. You know, we'll go see a raunchy video online and get a million hits, but we won't do a million hits to get somebody removed for violating our dignity and respect. And that's what we got to change. So it works both ways. So that's what we got to go out and do. That's right, Ron. I really appreciate your energy on that. I can see you are very good at organizing people. Well, and that's also a perfect segue to the last clip that we're that we're going to show. Um, but before I get to that, I just really want to emphasize that here at Courage, a really part of our work is to ensure that leaders, policies, and systems reflect all of us, the people, the public, but especially the people who are most affected. So I'm really happy to introduce this final clip um, in which we're going to start to imagine what the post office could be if each one was managed by the people who work there and interact with the public every day. Every post office should be a local workers cooperative, a group of workers whose job it is to make that institution as useful, as helpful to the local community as it knows how to be, free to do that in any way it sees fit. At one time, they were able to offer copying services in uh, post office lobbies, and <laughs> Kinko's got that shut down. They lobbied Congress, and all of a sudden, there's a law that you can't have copy machines in your local post office. The Postal Service has its hands tied by Congress. For example, up until 1968, you had postal savings system as part of the post office, and the banks didn't like it. Even though people used it, it was convenient, it was reliable, and the banks pressured Congress, they closed it down. You know, people have said, well, let the post office go into banking. Well. You know, that's not why we created the Postal Service. We got plenty of private banks that'll do banking. I think it might diffuse our mission. It might open us up to a lot of criticism. You know, the Postal Service didn't crash the economy and steal people's pensions. The Postal Service is there to provide a service for the people. Unless the banking community has completely abandoned a certain area, and there are some areas that are underbanked, 
There are only 30 million unbanked people in this country, and they could be the source of wonderful service in communities all over the country, because the most office is there, it doesn't have to be built, and they will produce revenue for the Postal Service. I think there's a lot of other adaptations that we could be leading the way in, such as a high-speed internet kiosk, access to a secure online bill payment center. There's communities all across the country that don't even have access to high-speed internet, period. And there's also many people that can't afford to have these services in their home. The Postal Service doesn't have to pay tax on their uh, building. So if we're going to do that, we've got to find a way to level the playing field so they don't put the mom and pop internet cafe a couple of blocks down out of business. This would be the government competing with the private sector. You betcha. And that's a good thing. Let the private sector have a competitor. To exclude the government means the private sector can do to us, the customers, what it wishes. There's no one else who benefits from that, not the public, not the country as a whole, but for the private alternative profit makers, that's why this was done. We understand their frustration about waiting in lines, the short staffing. We want to be the best. We've always strived to be the best, and to see all of what's fallen apart now, it hurts a lot of workers because we have pride. Let them be responsible not only to one another as workers, but to the community they serve. Let there be a board of the community, elected democratically, that interacts with this worker co-op to reach the decisions that serve this community best. It's a whole new way of organizing. The post office belongs to us. The post office belongs to the American people. I want to be able to bring back pride in being a postal worker. I'm proud to be a postal worker. I'm proud to be able to serve the American people. That means something. That means something to me. So, Jay, I really appreciate that. You know, we started with a clip that was really talking about um, the Postal Service as a community, and here it's bringing it back again to this theme of having worker-centered, community-centered solution, which is, again, like taking some of the power out of the leadership, which, Ron, as you mentioned, is very out of touch with sort of the day-to-days um, happening and don't have the relationship with with the with us, with the people in the communities. Um, so... One one thing that did come up um, in that clip again was that mention of postal banking, and so Jay, I don't know, or Ron, do you have updates? Um, is that an actual feasible option? Is that something that could be done? And what what would sort of be the next steps on on doing or returning postal banking? Um, well, I'll just start out. Uh, yeah, you know, there's. There's no act of Congress that's needed to implement postal banking. And in fact, you know, it's people luckily have been making enough noise about it for a number of years now that they have started a pilot program. The problem is <clears throat> with DeJoy at the helm, um, nobody knows about it. So um, it needs to be done in earnest. I think that, you know, as Representative Lynch pointed out and, and Ralph Nader pointed out, in, in there are these banking deserts. And so, you know, there's a need for it. But there's also a lot of people like myself and, and others who I'm sure would love a public banking option to, <clears throat> you know, to, to, to save our money at the post office and to have another reason to go there. Um, so, you know, there's there's a campaign for postal banking. I would encourage people to to you know look that up online. And there's you know they're always putting out petitions. Um, but this is something that you know the the Postal Service Office of the Inspector General has has written a number of white papers on talking about how they could implement it, the amount of revenue that they could see every year from it, um, and. Um, you know, again, it just creates another reason for people to interact with and more traffic for the Postal Service. So, yeah, it's very viable. 
Um, and I think it just needs to be done in a way that's, um, you know, with more vision in earnest, you know, where the Postal Service is actually um, letting people know how to use it and, you know, what it could what it could be done, because there were a couple small pilots that recently happened and they kind of, um, you know, were almost designed to fail. Yeah. Because of a lack of usage. I would say Jay covered that pretty well. Those are the same things that I heard. And I think there was a test site in Baltimore, it was one of those test sites, but I don't know how it came out over there. And I agree with this more opportunity, more jobs, more opportunities for the Postal Service to do something else for the community. Well, so with that, there's been several questions now um, about the Postal Service's Reform Act. So let me quickly just shift gears to just quickly mention this. So um, mm -hmm. while you guys said it's a complicated process to try to fire DeJoy or to change the minds of the, the, the Board of Governors, but there is something very concrete that we can do right now to start some of these reforms. So the U.S. House of Representatives recently passed the Postal Service Reform Act and that would restore the Postal Service's financial sustainability and also help to combat um, privatization. And now we need our senators to pass it now. Um, I believe they were trying to a little bit of a hitch, but hoping to try to do it in the next couple of weeks. Um, so with this act, of course, that's just one first step. There is a question from folks, of course, this yes. piece of legislation is also supported by DeJoy, and he's been very public about this. Is that a sign that we have to be worried about that bill? Um, Jay, if you want to answer first, and then Ron, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. No, I mean, I think, you know, the, the postmasters general of the past have always been asking for relief in earnest from, you know, these, um, you know, from the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act specifically. And I'm sure DeJoy would, would love to, you know, not be so, you know, under the gun by having, you know, all these losses piling up that are based on this law. So, you know, definitely, you know, the, the Postmaster General has an interest in this, in this law being passed. You know, how, um, how vocal he's going to be and how much of a champion he's going to be for when we see, um, you know, for instance, the Republican Senator from Florida trying to hold it up, you know, that person needs to be called out in a very public way. And, you know, I don't see the joy doing that, but, um, but yeah, no, like you said, it's, it's, it's a very necessary step to, to relieve the postal service of this burden. Um, and Ron, what do you sort of also see as some really concrete next steps and ways that, you know, our members, but also the general public can be more supportive of the Postal Service, postal workers, and again, trying to keep this as a very essential frontline public service? Yeah, I just doing the, the grassroots campaigning and, and signing on to like the AFL, CIO, or the union websites and, and telling the senators, you got to vote for this save our postal service. You know, the same way we held up them signs, we want to save it, you know? So that's basically what I would tell people to contact their senators and tell them to support the Postal Reform Act. You know, there's a few things in it. It's not everything probably that needs to be in it, but it's a start. And who knows what's going to happen, you know, in the week, next week or so because uh, Senator Bernie Sanders was pretty vocal about a lot of stuff that he wants the Postal Service to be able to do, you know, over the past few years. I don't know if he's had a chance to look at it and say, hey, what about this? Let them make copies, let them sell fishing, you know, licenses, you know, let them renew DMV stuff over there, you know? He may get, that may come across his desk and he may add some changes. But what people can do now is be telling people they're looking at it, they care about it. And I think all of the senators will start caring about it. So we, we might see a larger discussion in there. Uh, as far as uh, Mr. DeJoy, I think that he sees a lot of benefits in it. As long as he's seeing that we can keep six day mail, you know, I think that the unions will be happy and behind that. 
there's also something about uh, maximizing the Medicare participation, and, you know, and and repealing the, the free funding mandate, which is going to save the postal service a lot of money and frees up a lot of money to do other things, you know, like maybe buy new vehicles. Hopefully, they have some kind of electric vehicles, which I did see in the in the the postal board of governors meeting, the last one they had on the eighth or something. It looked like that's all he talked about was a future of electric vehicles, but I don't know when he planned to go for it. Since I heard some talk about the the gas uh, gas vehicles, and there's I guess there's some other administrative provisions in this legislation, but the grassroots is calling senators blow up those hotlines so they can know that everybody's watching them and want to hear about what are you going to do about the postal service because uh it works you know uh, i've talked to a lot of uh congress people you know uh congressmen and senators going to legislative affairs and uh and one of the things they say is it's amazing how many people don't talk to us they don't tell us what they think you know, and even some of the books that I've read about legislators, some of them are saying there, it's so surprising that people never contact me or tell me their issues. I'll get more people talking about a dolphin that washed up on the shore than the real issues in our communities and stuff. They they are wanting to hear from us. We've got to contact them. That's what they are there for. Now, they're going to be twiddling in their thumbs and finding other ways to tax us more or something. <laughs> So we have to put the pressure on them, and uh, that starts now. That's absolutely right, Ron. Uh, so again, I can't underscore this enough. This is the time to put pressure on senators. Not only do we not want them to lean their thumbs, we need them to do the work that we elected them to do. Um, so Jay, I want to just close this out with one final question for you. This all started with you as a very personal story with your father as a as a postal worker. How does it feel to have this film out? What are your plans for getting it out there so the public um, knows more about this? And what has this meant for your relationship with your with your dad being able to put your personal story out there, but have it also have much bigger movement meaning that Ron's talking about organizing, you know, really again, speaking to a whole community, not just as postal workers, but all of us who are served by them as well. Um, yeah, well, you know, to say that uh, my dad is proud of me is uh, is an understatement. It's really um, awesome to finally have finished this because, you know, for documentary filmmaking, it's... Uh, it's 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 a miracle documentary films get made often um especially you know unfunded documentaries there um usually is only you know one or two people um behind them and you know opportunity for me to mention uh, my my filmmaking partner and my partner sheila dvorak who was you know there at all the you know all the interviews and in the editing room um because you know it takes this kind of fire and drive um so for the you know dozen or so years since this began to lead up to an event like tonight i really thank courage california for putting this on because this is really what it's why i started it was to have these public conversations was to use the film as a tool for organizing and having these public conversations and i think that that is the way forward for me in this project um you know with cinema libre we're starting to get requests um from unions <clears throat> to screen the film and you know that's i think where it's going to begin is with with local chapters who see a potential to let their membership know about you know this is the history this is your labor history and this is what it's led up to and and what are we going to do to engage our customers and our public to get what we want out of what is our commonwealth you know it's it's about it's about the good jobs in all the communities but it's about this service that exists for all of us that we all own essentially and that's the message that i wanted to communicate when i started this film this quasi private quasi public thing what is this thing well what it is is it's ours and so we need to 
have this conversation about what we can make it. And a big part of that is um, having these, having these, you know, having the community decide, having a more decentralized approach to what the Postal Service offers. The post office can offer something to each community that it, that it exists in if it's freed from this hierarchical top-down, um, you can only do this and you can't do that mentality. And so, yeah, that's what I hope for the film is just for, you know, unions and, you know, community members to pick it up and let's let's show it in a, you know, in a town hall type setting and, and start this conversation about this partnership that we can see. Right. Uh, postal service by us for us. Um, again, I can't underscore enough. Also, remember to call your senators, um, no matter where they're at on the political spectrum. This pressure needs to be across the board and ongoing. I think, Ron, like you were saying, the key to this is just organize, organize, organize. This is the start. This bill, this Postal Reform Act is just one step, and we obviously need to do more. We already know corporations and the folks on the other side, they've just been going at this for decades, and they're constantly... Um, moving forward on their plan. And we have to be able to meet them step by step and go further as well. So um, I also want to uh, take a, a few minutes as well. Um, Cinema Libre Studio, of course, who put together uh, this film, also has done a lot of other films on issues um, in communities that Courage also really cares about as well. So before we close out for this evening, I, I, we want to just show a brief reel of some of the other films produced by Cinema Libre Studio. All right, so uh, everyone be sure to check out Cinema Libre Studio's incredible catalog of films on their website. Um, and Ron, I know you do, you have a podcast, so I want to give you a quick second to just quickly mention your podcast because it's, oh, it's been lovely to both see you in the film and now to hear you. You have that fire, and so I'd love for you to give a chance to um, tell people a little bit about your podcast as well. Okay. Well, I can tell you, but podcasts, well, I, I did about 90 podcasts and I numbered one through 80 and I did a bunch of other uh, different scenarios in my podcast. It's called Postal Views Podcast. And uh, I, I'm not, they're no longer in production. I'm not doing them anymore. But I, I did write a, a book and it's called Personality and Distribution Center, which I hope people will go out and see. And it's Personality and Distribution Center, PNDC. And it's surviving a postal paradigm. Uh, one of the things I, the reason I put that personality in there is because personalities are talked about more than processes. And even though the way world, world uh, mail has worked, 
we'll be, it'll be around a lot longer than any one person. I tell you how I was in the crowd, but I wasn't part of the crowd. So, and uh, as a unionized workforce, we could get a lot more done if more people were willing to get into good trouble. And that's what my whole life at the post office was about getting into good trouble. And I never got into bad trouble. Organizing is a great thing. My podcasts are full of things that I saw in the postal service that I wanted to improve. I thought would would get better. You know, it, everything from a carrier throwing a package down the street, how that's not cool out there today. You know, we got to change that ethical, unethical behavior. And, and even the leadership challenges where management needs to get involved and they got to listen to the employees and let's work together to make this the strongest postal service in the world. So read my book and listen to the podcasts. And uh, thank you so much, Jay, for having me. Uh, thank you, uh, Courage California. With Courage We Can, there's no doubt about that. And Cinema Libre for for taking care of the workplace and telling the workplace story, you know, through through film. So I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Jay, for having me. Awesome. And if I could just add, you know, if I could just add real quick, um, when I when I first thought I was going to be interviewing postal workers, I put a message out on a postal message board and I heard from Ron that more the next day I got it. I got a message back from Ron and I and I and I read his books and I wasn't far from Ron. So I could go out and interview him. And I was thinking, wow, this is great. This is going to be this is going to be easy. Postal workers are going to want to talk to me and I'm going to get to and I'm going to get to interview and meet all these great people but you know it was it was just ron v and ron because it was a real hard it, it nobody else was like that you know it was there was a real chill and the movie talks about why there's a chill why people don't want to talk to some filmmaker or the press about their job at the postal service but ron had no fear from the beginning ron you know wanted to tell the postal story in his books in his podcast and to me and I'm just glad that we're here at the end of the day where I can share this story of Ron and people like him who wanted to, um, who, who, you know, who knew that the Postal Service can't do anything to me for talking about the truth, for telling, for telling mm -hmm. the truth and for, and, you know, for having a voice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as far as just an employee manual of, you know, of how Ron, you know, entered this wild culture and made good, had a, had a way to, you know, connect with his peers. I, I would definitely encourage people to check out the book on, uh, you know, sir, um, personality and distribution center. Yeah, definitely worth, worth, a having on your shelf as a postal worker or anybody who cares about the post office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jay. Also, I want to thank both of you, Jay and Ron. It certainly takes a lot of courage to keep fighting in an environment where it can be really discouraging, dispiriting. Um, mm -hmm. But I still see that fire in you, Ron, and it's it's really inspiring. It's really motivating. And Jay, I also appreciate the courage it takes to to take something so personal to be able to speak on behalf of a whole workforce and for our communities, and to put that out there, knowing that again, like these are very powerful. Um, corporate forces out there. Um, so I want to thank you both for your courage. Um, and I want to also take this time to thank all of you, our members, for joining us this evening, Cinema Libre Studio for sharing their film with us, um, Jay and Ron, again, for, for you guys bringing this to light, discussing this evening with us. I also want to thank Hidra Hamid and Neil Cordova from ASL Pro Bono for providing tonight's inspiration. And again, one last time, I just want to underscore, we really need to advocate for protecting a postal service that is critical to our well-being and our civic vitality. I hope you watch the rest of the Great Postal Heist to learn more about the Postal Service. And again, reach out to your senators today to demand that they pass the Postal Service Reform Act. And keep an eye on your email inboxes to continue to mobilize with courage to make sure your voice is heard and support the Postal Service and its worker. With courage, we can fight to save the post office as a public service and ensure that all workers are treated with dignity. Thank you all again, and good night. Good night. Good night.